get everybody in. Come in, come in. Come into our little art room. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start and then as I'm talking, hopefully more people will join us. But as I say, it's going to be recorded. So welcome, everybody, to uh, another open talk by Leicester Art Gallery, Photography and Video, Fine Art at De Montfort University. I'm Professor Lala Meredith Vula, and today we've got a really special program uh, where we've got three complete international artists and experts, curators, and um, who are going to share their work. We've got Jeff Thomas there, who's um, in on he's in Ottawa at the moment uh, it's morning in the Ottawa and he's had his morning breakfast so that's good um, he's an artist a self-taught photo-based storyteller writer public speaker uh, and curator and we then we have Patrick Mahone who's in London Canada um, and um, he's also just had his breakfast live from London, Canada, and he's a professor of visual arts at the Western University in London, Canada, uh, and also a writer, artist, curator, um, internationally exhibiting as well. And then we have Mark Kasumovich, who's in Leicester, um, actually at De Montfort as we speak. I, I know that angle poise lamp in the corner there <laughs> um, and he's also an artist and head of program leader for photography and video uh, an international exhibiting artist and they're going to talk about a really brilliant exhibition um, that's currently on in London Canada um, uh, called the garden ship and state so I'm going to hand over because we've not got a lot of time to uh, Patrick and we're going to share screens, aren't we? Great, thank you so much, Anala. And, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And, and uh, thank you to, to uh, Lala and Mark, who helped to uh, coordinate getting us involved. And great to see my collaborator, Jeff Thomas. So as, as Lala said, I'm one of the uh, co-curators of the exhibition. Before I begin, I want to recognize that I'm here in London, Canada, on Turtle Island, which is also known as North America. And I'm located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Luna Pewak, and the Chinantan nations. And these are lands that are uh, connected with the London Township and the Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. And I respect the long-standing relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land as its original caretakers. So it's great to be here with Jeff and Mark. And as, as Lala said, we're going to be focusing on the exhibition Gardenship and State. And you can see the title wall there in, on the slide. And we're going to be trying to address this kind of broad question. How can artistic curating and intervention act as means for promoting and facilitating community engagement? And that was one of the things that we were very much related to with the exhibition. Our show emerged from a plan that we wrote and were uh, funded um, to, uh, to produce uh, through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So about five years ago, the, uh, the project began as an idea. And we always knew that we wanted to lend voice to what I think we all recognize as the problem of our times, environmental catastrophe. And we wanted to do that in light of the urgent challenges and opportunities that are inherent to the work of decolonization. So the exhibition really took about two years of, of collaborative work among artists and writers and just had a run at what's called Museum London in London, Canada. Um, and that is a, a quite a, a large public gallery museum located at the forks of the Deshkanzibi River. And that's the traditional name for the river, which is also called the Thames River, which will be a little more familiar as a, as a name to you. Um, Gardenship and State is focused also on a confluence. And so it brought together a diverse group of 20 artists um, from Turtle Island, that's Canada and the United States, and also Mark from the UK. So five years ago, when we began to look for, or I began to look for collaborators and other supporters for this environmentally focused project, 
Um, we knew, or I knew that I wanted to try and emphasize uh, the distinct origins of artists and their experiences and not treat borders as barriers. And so I turned to Jeff Thomas, who I knew I'd known for a long time as an amazing photographer, curator, and storyteller. Teller. And I was really thrilled that Jeff agreed to be the co-curator of the exhibition. And, and Jeff's going to talk a little bit about what he brought to the I think you could call it the discourse of the exhibition. But before that, I'm going to give you a brief tour of the show. And you'll see that it emphasizes, in terms of materials, it emphasizes textiles, photography, sculpture, video, gardening, and installation. And all the works, I think, are engaged in one way or another with issues that cut across the decolonial, the environmental, and also protest against government and industrial complicity in the ongoing climate crisis. So Mark, we'll, uh, we'll move ahead. Well, actually, no, I'll stop there. Um, maybe if you wanna go, can you go back? Yeah. So this is um, actually the main floor of Museum London. And then the majority of the exhibition is in the upstairs galleries there. And so when you come into the gallery, you see these large banner uh, images by Indigenous artist Laurie Blondeau, who is originally from Saskatchewan and is now uh, living in Winnipeg. And the title is called Isque on Lake Winnipeg. And it's a, uh, it's an, um, homage to um, to um, the subject of, of women, indigenous women, and a very powerful image that actually has as a backdrop the frozen Lake Winnipeg um, in in the midst of of Prairie Canada. Um, Alongside her work is a small video, and this is a video made by a poet, and it's called Upstream Downstream, where he interviewed people who were actually doing river cleanups, both in London and also on the reserve, Oneida Reserve downstream from London, Ontario. And there's a real emphasis on looking at what the, um, basically the, the problem of, of that upstream downstream relationship looks like, okay? <laughs> When we go up into the main gallery, um, this is the first room of the exhibition, and Jeff is going to be talking about his two works there. Um, those are the ones uh, surrounded by the red border. And there's also the other version of, of uh, Tom Cull's upstream downstream piece. It's a two channel video. One of the videos is upstairs and one is downstairs when you enter. And there's also this huge bison head. And if you wanna go on to the next slide, please mark. And this is a work by, um, the, the bison head is borrowed from the Manitoba Museum in, in the middle of Canada in Winnipeg. And Michelle's work is entitled uh, Forced Migration. And it looks at both the, the decimation of bison in Canada and, and in, in North America, and the movement of bison supposedly uh, around issues of conservation, but ultimately the way in which conservation was itself another sort of colonial uh, project. And when you go up to the what is an embroidered map and you touch the map, there are actually um, sound stories that, that are activated. So we'll go on. Um, at the Manitoba Museum, and, and it, it was a little bit of a focal point in as much as it's in another city, a number of us had connections there. Uh, the curator, Amelia Fay, is the curator of, of what's called the Hudson Bay Company Collection. And as many of you would know, Hudson Bay Company was a colonial, uh, you know, organization that had a lot to do with, with the early so-called colonization of Canada. And so the Hudson Bay Company is a huge collection of artifacts that include um, objects and 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 um, crafts and other other materials uh, made by indigenous peoples um, it, through uh, generations. Um, the uh, one of the major problems, besides the many problems with museums, is that there's no names on these on these works. These particular moccasins, which Amelia Fay brought to Museum London, really have just the name of the the settler who actually purchased them. So. Amelia, as a curator, has done these small embroideries, and they really are, the title of her work is called Curating Colonialism. So she's really asking questions about her own practice. The next one. 
Um, so then we move into the, the larger areas of, of the museum. And these are works by Charmise the Carr. The, there's the tent structure in the center of the gallery. And there's also um, that tarpaulin uh, with, a, with a tent um, figure um, embroidered onto it. And um, these works are called Soft Shelter and Home and Land, Walking Together. And Sharmista, who uh, is uh, an artist from India who lives in Canada, is really looking at migration and, and forms of, of temporary lodging. Um, and then the work on the right hand side is actually mine, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Next one. And now we have an installation shot of many other works in the exhibition. Um, in front of you is, uh, is a mosaic uh, by Jamili Hassan. And, uh, and the mosaic is entitled Gizzard Shad. It looks at the influx of fish into the Deshkanzibi River in an unlikely way that was a kind of representation of, of, um, of changes due to climate. There's a work on the wall above a chair, and that's, uh, that's by Andres Villar, and uh, that's called Birdsong. And then there's the work of, of Mark Kasumovic in the background there, the photographs, and Mark is going to be talking about that. Also, there's a library piece by Mary Mattingly from the United States, which is called Ecotopian Library. And then on the right-hand side, another um, another mosaic by Jamili Hassan, which is based on one of the protest signs of Greta Thunberg. So we'll move on. Now we have... Um, uh, several other pieces in the exhibition. In the distance, we have a work by Michael Farnan, and I actually have a better slide of it, so so I'll, I'll mention that work after. And then in uh, to the right of that is a series of sculptural works by Sean Caulfield from Alberta, and this is called Power Lines. And Sean, these are almost like toy-like works that are sculptures, and Sean is looking the at the way that that attitudes towards energy are um, ultimately inculcated through children, through teaching, and um, it's, it's both playful and, and somewhat disturbing work. Okay, next one, please. So there's Michael Farnan's map, and the map has quite a long, wonderful title. It's, it's called The Map Depicting the Settlement History of the Land, Plants, Animals, People, and Water Between Here and There, Here Being Where I Am, and There Being Where You Are, A Work in Progress. And so Michael is really looking at, at a history of colonization, and at the same time, um, it's he himself uh, lives in a Métis community in, in up north of, of London, Ontario. So looking at the, the sort of disruptions of colonialization and, and all the sort of intended um, effects on, on communities in the region and throughout Canada. And on the right hand side, another, uh, you can see actually one of Mark's photographs peeking uh, beyond. And then there is uh, a, one of Laurie Blondeau's smaller photos. Uh, next one, please. And this is a wonderful work by Adrian Stimson, who is an Indigenous artist from Siksika Nation in Alberta. And um, in, in the Siksika language, and I hope I do okay with this, it's Namoy Stututsin, uh, Bumblebee Regalia. And um, Adrian has looked at the history of what was called the, the, um, the, the Bumblebee Society, which was a teaching society for um, children to learn the protocols of the teepee and the protocols of the society. And Adrian has been interested in the possibility of, of being involved in, in helping to, to see the, this society reinstated. Next one. This is another, actually another work by, by Michael Farnan. It's uh, called uh, Meditation on a Repetitive Stress Injury, uh, Stress Injury to the, the Planet. Um, and so that's a video. And then in the distance is a work by Ashley Snook called The Honey is Sweet. And it's looking at invasive species, a particular invasive species, um, which uh, was actually sort of brought into our region uh, in the, the 19th century, I believe from Australia. Next one. This is a mammoth piece by Ron Benner, who's an important London Ontario artist. Uh, it's called As the Crow Flies, and it's looking at the movement of, of food 
and culture and at the presence of indigenous peoples on the lines of longitude between or that run south from Toronto, Canada and London, Canada, um, all the way to the bottom of South America. And the work is based on eight trips that Ron made. It's about a 30 year old work now. And you can see that there's all kinds of found artifacts um, and texts that um, really sort of uh, really underpin this amazing work. OK. And these are two works by Quinn Smallboy, who is an Indigenous artist from Moose Factory, Ontario. They're both entitled Drum Ring. Um, the, one, the large one, which is, is 10 feet in diameter, um, is just called Colors. And um, actually, I'm sorry, the one on the left, which is smaller, it's, it's four feet in diameter. It's called Colors. And the other is called Lines. And these um, were made by Quinn in the gallery, especially the large one, strung and wrapped with with uh, string, which is is his main material for these spectacular works. Next one. And this is another view of, of Quinn's work and also a work by uh, Paul Chartrand. It's uh, it's uh, the the one called that has the text all flesh is grass is called desiccated root text and it's actually a grown plant based text that is Im embedded behind glass um, there's a table piece there and paul had made a table um, in which the words sustain are growing and it was located in a cafe a non-profit cafe um, and so they were actually using some of the grown materials uh, from the, the, the word sustain as part of their salads in, in the cafe itself. So Paul's very interested in those kinds of interactions. Next one. And this is a work by Jessica Karuhanga, whose uh, family are originally from Ghana. It's called Blue as the Insides, and it's a real meditation on um, the, the experience, the life of a young black woman. We see her interiorly, exteriorly, and there's a real sort of tension between the, the sort of outdoor and the indoor spaces that we uh, encounter her in. And then the last work I'm showing you is by Jamila Hassan. I mentioned her other mosaics. This is one that is located out on the lawn of the museum. And uh, it's it's a dedication, it's a map of the Deshkan Zibing. And so one of the things that our exhibition and others in the community have been very, very interested in is the the renaming or the the return to the the name the Deshkan Zibi. And so um, and so Jamili is really pointing to that with this wonderful piece. I'm going to wrap up what I'm saying just with a few comments on my own work. So we'll go ahead, Mark. And so you see Jamili's uh, mosaic in front of you. And then there's these three large works that I made. Um, you can go ahead to the, the first one. Mark. Thanks. So this is um, I, my background is is printmaking, and I'm really interested in signs and emblems and markers of place, both for ceremonial and ritual purposes. And so, in thinking about um, land and colonialism, I was really interested in the kinds of symbols that we we often encounter in relation to some of the the um, the challenges and 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 the opportunities that that some of these sites actually remind us of. So. I was fortunate that Jeff Thomas lent me his photograph, which is um, of the Caledonia protest site in 2008. And so in the image, and if you want to go to the um, to the detail, you'll see that there are flags and then there are signs and the other things that that were placed at this at this site of of protest. And the way the work is made is it's actually carved into mat board. And I was really interested in making images. The series is called Threshold Flags. I was interested in making images that suggest that we're at a moment of transition of change and transformation. And at the same time, you know, I'm asking the viewer to kind of look hard and to, in a sense, put these images together with their own eyes. So if you want to go on to the next one, please, Mark. 
This one is is called HBC flag on the non such and, and that was a replica ship um, that is in the Manitoba Museum. And then I overlaid it with the uh, the um, a nautical flag pattern, which is supposed to refer to desire to communicate. I, I don't think or there is actually a detail of this one as well, please. And you can see that so the the actual drawing is carved in and, and it's incised or it's inlaid with with these kind of glittery paints. And then there's this dot pattern that's over overlaid. And the last one I'm going to show you before I turn it over to Jeff, and I don't think I have a detail of this one. It's really hard to see. It's called University Building with Tree and Rock, and it was based on a photograph that my nephew took. I will say all the frames actually have um, the title engraved into them, and I was really interested here in the balance between this kind of historical building and the um, emblems of nature uh, represented through the tree and the rock. So I will leave it at that and uh, turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Patrick. And um, I think um, where I'll begin is to talk about um, my role as the uh, co-curator in the exhibition and what I brought um, to the conversations that were taking place in regards to the um, the theme of the exhibition and uh, finding a way to uh, bridge gaps that have been culturally um, entrenched in Canada for hundreds of years in terms of um, the uh, subjugation of Indigenous people um, on Turtle Island. And uh, my, uh, my elder, who lives or did live at the Six Nations of the Grand River uh, Reserve in Southern Ontario, had been a, a very prominent activist in her um, early days. She was a teacher and she was also um, a theater promoter on the reserve. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and so when I work in the arts, I believe that um, I do it out of a necessity to uh, social social change. And it came from my elder uh, Emily General in terms of uh, instilling in me when I was a teenager and asking questions. <clears throat> about uh, my hybridity, which was the fact that I was born and raised in the city of Buffalo, New York. And throughout my early life, I had been trying to find a way to balance the two. And if there was a balance, uh, could it be made? And so I looked at the arts as, uh, as a place where I could um, find and develop some sort of uh, agency in terms of uh, its relevance to the political issues that are going on and have been going on uh, and will be going on into the future uh, in Canada and the United States. So um, the battling that history of kind of uh, isolation, which is um, when uh, Indigenous people were put on reserves in Canada, the idea was to put them um, out of sight, out of mind. And so I think that the really the um, the issues that are faced is how do we how do we integrate ourselves into uh, mainstream society without losing touch of uh, of our, I'd like to say our Indianness and uh, what brought us to this point. So coming into this project, uh, Patrick had um, had, as he said, uh, extended the invitation to me. And he had um, selected a number of artists that he wanted to work with. And a lot of them were, a lot of the artists, his work that I was unfamiliar with. And, and so I had to find my way into the exhibition. And what I decided that I wanted to do was to work with uh, what's called the Two Row Wampum Treaty, which you see an example hanging up in uh, above the wall, above the temporary wall here, which is basically. It's a, a belt made of uh, purple and white beads. And um, this really, they say that wampum began to take off when Europeans began to arrive in Canada and they saw it as a currency and started manufacturing uh, these beads, which take a lot of labor in order to produce them. And so, but the initial, uh, the initial role for, for having a belt was like an archive where you go to find information about the past or whatever. And in this case, the wampum belt <clears throat> serves the same purpose 
of commemorating a specific event that took place. <clears throat> in our, in, here in Canada, what happened, or in, in uh, New York State too, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people um, lived in Canada and the United States. And originally we were, um, our homeland was in New York State. But um, the idea was is that the, um, in 16, around the early part of the 16th century, the, uh, the Iroquois, the uh, Mohawk people who live on the uh, eastern side of um, New York State are kind of designated as, as the uh, doorkeepers, that the protectors of that part of the uh, of Turtle Island. And so what, what they did is they saw the, uh, the Dutch had been settling around that area, around present day uh, New York, uh, Albany, New York and New York City. And so they thought, uh, my ancestors thought that they had to find a way to talk about um, how we're gonna live and survive um, here together. And so this is where they came up with the Turo Wampum which is essentially uh, representing uh, two boats traveling down the river um, side by side, and in effect, um, respecting each other uh, and not interfering with each other's um, culture, history, and uh, future. So it was just really kind of an agreement that uh, this is how we're gonna get along uh, during this period of time. So. I wanted, to, and, and I should also say that uh, it's probably, I think it's been kind of designated as the first treaty that took place in, in uh, North America or Turtle Island in uh, 1613. So the idea here was that it's a living document and, and the people that live in Haudenosaunee communities still practice and carry on uh, the, um, the spirit of the Chua Wampum. And the other side is missing from that. So uh, non-Indigenous people um, have kind of uh, moved on, and um, but our, my people continue to honor the treaties that were established. So with that in mind, I decided that I wanted to bring it into guardianship and state because we were dealing or not dealing, but we had um, you know. A, a, different artists from different parts of the world, different cultures. And um, so how do you bring everybody together into an exhibition space that, um, that um, we can all learn from each other and bridge that uh, historical gap of colonialism, of division and isolation. So this is really what um, I felt that I can contribute to gardenship and uh, use those principles. And it was a very interesting process. And I should say that too, with the pandemic and not being able to travel, that we conducted the whole uh, uh, series of studio visits by Zoom. And there was something uh, that was very, uh, that was remarkable about the, about the process because um, we found that from, from group meetings with, with artists and writers to uh, select studio visits with artists, that uh, there was kind of an intimacy that, that came from, uh, from this process of Zoom. And um, we had some of the most wonderful conversations with artists and sharing. And uh, this began to um, come through as a group and people coming together and talking and sharing. And so we began to find a lot of uh, commonalities and things that are shared. So I collaborated with, uh, uh, with two artists, well, actually with three artists in the exhibition, including Patrick using uh, several of my photographs. So here in this space, uh, what you see is the, the Tura Wampum flag up here. And then uh, my work, um, uh, bordered with the red here and uh, and then you see the back of the buffalo or the bison head in the center and on the far right is is um, Tom calls video and the reason that we put it here is that when I saw the video and he had a beautiful uh, sequence of corn that he included um, in this video and uh, after having seen it and talked to him and that we decided that 
Uh, and Patrick suggested that we actually put it in this room next to my work. So the idea here with my work was to have two panels that talk and address the issues that I felt that were most important. I think we can go to the next slide. There should be, a, yeah, there's the detail. And um, this piece is really based on, on the idea of, um, of treaties. So we here on the far right, you see a painted portrait of the uh, renowned Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt. And um, he's the reason that we actually ended up in Canada because uh, uh, half of the Confederacy of the Haudenosaunee sided with the British, the other half remained neutral or sided with the Americans. And here the uh, Joseph Brandt uh, because of his relationship with the British, uh, was given special land after the Revolutionary War along the Grand River. And um, that's been a disputed land uh, since, uh, since my ancestors began moving up at the end of the uh, 17th century, uh, leaving from, uh, from New York State into Canada. So here, I, what I've done uh, quite often is as a photographer, and as an indigenous person, I found that photographing the world in terms of documentary or street photography uh, was always a bit problematic for me because I was photographing worlds that were not a part of my own personal history um, culturally. And so I wanted to be able to uh, make photographs that, um, that added something to the image in a way that uh, uh, what I called the intervention. And this was using these uh, Indian figurines that I found in gift shops. And here, this one is called Chief Red Rope. And he's at the end of the Grand River and um, making his way up to the settlement that took place along the Grand River uh, by my ancestors. The piece in the middle, the center of uh, the black and white photograph it was shot in Albany, New York. And it just happened to be something that I found by um, uh, by accident because uh, I was more interested in going to see the train station because I have a series that uh, is kind of based on the, well, it is based on the train history in, in Canada and the United States. But uh, here across from the train station was this monument that depicted uh, a person of Dutch ancestry and uh, an indigenous person on the right-hand side. And so in between is the seal or the uh, city seal. Um, and the idea here was to show the, uh, the original relationship between the Dutch and, um, and my ancestors. So, and I, I named it Broken Treaties because the photograph, um, the next one, the color photograph of the demonstration site that uh, Patrick had mentioned uh, was and still remains a protest site for probably over a decade now. And um, it's ongoing. And this is the uh, part of the photograph that Patrick uh, uh, used for his piece that he showed you. It's a bit wider. There's another version of it that shows a wider uh, scan of the uh, flags that are a part of the demonstration site as well. And, um, and then here on the uh, far left is uh, tanker cars that are transporting uh, corn syrup. And the reason that I put that image there is that it leads to the next panel, which um, we'll look at now. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this one is what, these were two uh, panels that were made for, for the exhibition. This one is called Corn Equals Life. And the reason for this one is, is that the, is the role that corn played in the development of more advanced uh, societies uh, uh, in tur at Turtle Island before Europeans arrived. And very few people know that, uh, like with the Aztecs and the Mayans had their, uh, their temple mounds and things like that, up here in the upper part of Turtle Island, we also had mounds that were, that were made, but they were made from earth. And uh, this one was particularly around St. Louis, Missouri, 
around uh, the year 700 that they started building these enormous mounds. And they had actually at that time populations around that area, around what was called the Hokia, uh, that were larger than uh, the cities in uh, like London at the, at the same time. So here uh, they had thousands and thousands of people that were there. And the reason that that emerged was because of the role and development of corn. And so it gave the people in, in these different communities time to elaborate more on their ceremonies and culture and that. So it played a very important part in, in, in our world. And I wanted to honor that as a way of continuing to look at corn as a way of, uh, in this case, of guardianship and state of building conversations. So here, these panels are really kind of following the footsteps of the wampum belt. They're um, my way of commemorating certain events and things and thoughts that I've had over the years. And uh, these two photographs that you see here actually came from uh, one Thanksgiving. My uh, step-grandfather, Bert General, uh, was braiding uh, his harvest of white corn. <clears throat> and as you can see, the way that on the left side, the way that it's braided, um, and then on the right hand side, it was just put over um, a, an old swing set that was in the yard there. Traditionally, it would have been on the rafters of a longhouse, but this is how um, this is kind of an updated version of it. And I think, can we go back to the uh, to the previous one? I, I just wanted to finish there. Yeah. And so here on the um, on the left-hand side is a woman from Six Nations. Her name is Mrs. Fish. And she was visited by an anthropologist here in Ottawa who in the early 20th century um, was called the Geological Survey of Canada. And so uh, this particular um, uh, ethnologist, Maurice Barbeau, was looking for white corn. So he went to Six Nations. And one of the first places he went to was my elder's home. He didn't find any corn there. And then he finally found it at Mrs. Fish's house. And the interesting thing here is this is typical of the way that anthropologists worked in Canada. Um, they were documenting uh, their field work, in fact, and they weren't setting up photographs that, um, that highlighted uh, the ceremonial uh, kind of uh, events and things like that. These were shots of everyday people. So they were quite remarkable and are now housed at the Canadian Museum of History. So this is entry into the Swampum Belt. And, uh, and then you go through the photographs here. And then the final one on the far right hand side is a photograph made by Edward S. Curtis. Uh, this was um, in the American uh, Northwest that he made this photograph around, I believe, 1908 or 1910. And Curtis has been a typical figure that's been looked at uh, and highlighted because of his romantic depictions of indigenous culture. And in fact, an indigenous culture that had already vanished in terms of losing its tribal identity. And But he recreated that um, and uh, had people uh, pose for him in these communities. And this is a, a baby in a cradle port. And I wanted to show this as uh, taking a, a, a typical photograph of indigenous people here with Curtis and repurposing it to address life. And then, uh, of course, with the other uh, type of photograph that was made by Marius Barbeau, so there's a lot of information that's encapsulated in here. And one of the things about the wampum belt is that um, we have a keeper of the wampum belts and the keeper um, is designated with uh, remembering the stories that go along with the wampum belts and can recite them all as well. So this is really uh, what my work has determined to do as well is to be able to tell a story. So uh, can we move on uh, to, the, I think it'll be the one after this. Yes. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, that came out of, um, out of the planning for the exhibition and what I really give uh, Patrick, uh, among other things, a lot of credit for is that uh, he gave me space to work in the ex in the museum 
that I maybe normally wouldn't have taken. I don't really consider myself an installation uh, based artist, but for this one, I decided that I'm gonna move in a different direction. And the story behind this one is, is that if you remember looking at Ron Benner's work, um, Ron and I met many years ago and became friends and um, he's done a lot of work with uh, plants and uh, rare seeds and uh, gardens. And so outside the window here is that Ron had one of his uh, gardens uh, out there. And originally before COVID uh, really took over everything, we were hoping that the exhibition would coincide or we could have an event with Ron's garden down there because he has a corn roast every fall. And, uh, but it wasn't gonna happen uh, in 2021. So, but anyways, I, I began to rethink uh, what I wanted to do. And because um, uh, uh, London is located on the confluence of the other rivers there, is that I wanted to use it and think about its historical use by indigenous people as a meeting ground and coming together and um, so here, the chair represents the, uh, the elder, the past, the idea of waiting for the delegates to arrive and, um, and to greet them. So the photographs on the left-hand side, it shows uh, the kind of environmental take that began in 1973 uh, in the United States in the use of Iron Ice Cody, the, the crying Indian, who in fact was not a crying Indian. And because this was my first exhibition uh, looking at environmental issues, I wanted to use my childhood memory of that, of that poster, which I found on eBay, and juxtaposed it with the photograph of uh, Chief Red Robe in, um, in Ottawa uh, with Parliament Hill in the background. And then the corn tankers, that corn syrup tankers that I had photographed in London several years ago are down here as well. On the right-hand side is uh, shows my step-grandfather in the center in the black and white photograph. And then Ron had sent me a box filled with uh, produce that he had grown in his uh, garden. And so I re-photographed these here in my studio holding the corn because I was looking at corn as kind of a symbol of, of, uh, of uh, of greeting, but also of telling about where you come from in terms of, uh, of uh, the importance of corn. And then down at the bottom, it's a little hard to see, but it's called, I call it the ghost chair. And it was a chair that I photographed just outside my elder's home. It doesn't have a seat on it, but the idea was to remember uh, my, the role of my elders and here's tobacco that Ron had grown as well. So this is the, uh, my, my, um, partnership with Ron Benner in that. So I'm not quite sure. I think I might have gone over time here. Um, so I think I'll probably um, slow down here a bit and, and uh, just say that um, this was um, this is uh, was really a, a remarkable exhibition, I think, in terms of looking at it now that um, that it's coming down is it's just how important the journey was. And I think in terms of community, we were able to develop um, a sense of community with the artists, the writers in the exhibition. And of course, Patrick and I, who have known each other for a number of years, were able to find a way to, um, to coexist as co-curators for the exhibition and come away with something that we're very proud of and, um, and continue, we'll continue to uh, work with the publication on, on the, for the exhibition as well. And I think that might be good for me. So I don't wanna pass it on. That's great. And, and thank you both. It's, it's wonderful to hear your perspectives again about the exhibition. Um, I'm just going to present as quickly as possible a few of the, the, the things that I produced for the exhibition, uh, being mindful to leave a little bit of time. Hopefully there's some questions that are interesting to people. Um, but for me, this photograph in particular stood out as, you know, the one, the one that if I could only choose one photograph for this exhibition, this is, this is it for me. And I think I was really, really excited when I took this photograph because this is a this is taken on and most of, all of these photographs are taken on conservation ground. And when I first moved to the UK, I was really interested in um, the area I moved to, uh, having grown up in a place called Hamilton, Ontario, which is adjacent to Toronto. 
and just identifying you know with that city being a, a steel town or very very much an industrial part of canada or the heart of, of what you know we would consider the industrial heart of that region in particular for sure and then moving to a place called middlesbrough which is very near uh, another place called stockton and and the seal sands and this area is kind of familiar to people in the north as as the place where the apocalyptic Blade Runner kind of opening scene was was shot and I, I kind of that really resonated with me that this decades old film identified this area that I'm now living in as the, the apocalyptic area um, or representation, you know, of, of, you know, perhaps society collapsing, maybe due to industrialization or, or whatever happens. But I really loved this particular photograph because it's on a conservation ground. Um, and it's a bird watching hut. But what was really fascinating to me is that you're surrounded by heavy industry in this bird watching hunt. So this hut that, you know, I'm sure lots of wonderful birds come and visit this area. But for me, it became this kind of symbol for a place to watch the world slowly, you know, maybe exhaust itself possibly, or just a place to have conversations and just think about, um, you know, the current state of maybe an environmental crisis or a climate crisis or, or, or something like that. So it's not just a bird watching hut, but it's kind of like a human watching hut for me. It was really hard to find another photograph like this. Uh, that was my original intention when I got this photograph. I was thinking, OK, hopefully others like this exist. But, you know, this is a pretty special spot for me. Uh, but coming from a project that was very much interested in working with scientists and looking at how science represents the world and how artists represent the world and how sometimes some of the methodologies we use are remarkably similar, they just have different outputs. Um, and that mentality of thinking about, you know, the kind of the way we represent the world, I, I became interested in the, the quiet representation of perhaps, you know, the subtle representation of things collapsing or falling apart and the kind of beauty in that inherently that we're drawn to, but also um, hinting at, you know, just a, a slow decay. And we and, and, and living at, on the coast at that time, it, it became apparent that there are coastal communities that, you know, there is a visible uh, ramifications to certain things that humans are doing. Um, and, and they are often very subtle. And a lot of what we think about when we think about how do we represent things that are very difficult to represent in images like climate change and like the kind of science that backs up some of the, 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 the information that we're getting about what's happening on the planet. It is hard to represent these things. So the pictures for me are often they have to be subtle in order to be interesting. They also have to be romantic. So this kind of romantic beauty um you know of the land falling uh, of the sea levels rising perhaps and and you know the land falling back into the sea and for me uh i guess as long as you know i've been thinking about this and even as a child i was you know uh, thinking about um the fact that you know humans are perhaps we may become extinct, but you know something tells me that you know the planet will 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 move on beyond us. So this kind of romantic feeling that you know it doesn't matter, everything's going to be okay, even if everything goes to heck. Um, but for me, it was really about just w walking around and also observing the landscape and also finding these subtle clues of you know strange um, occurrences. So things like this kind of oddly glistening substance producing these beautiful patterns as you look down on the ground to the kind of uh, the beauty that still remains in, this, in these sand dunes, of, you know, walking, even though you're surrounded by heavy industry, this kind of strange place in particular, uh, where, where we are walking on conservation grounds that are also, you know, surrounded by things that are probably making it hard to conserve <laughs> some of these landscapes. Um, so the photographs were, were, were wonderful for me to just show a kind of picturesque um, type of space with these kinds of you know, industrial intervention. But also a video that I made in conjunction uh, is all about the scientists, perhaps, you know, all over the world, scientists are measuring very small things. 
it's a very quiet type of research. It's visually uninteresting with this kind of measuring that's happening in order to determine what's happening uh, with climate change and with ideas of, uh, you know, some kind of crisis. You know, they're not visually dynamic photographs. For So for me, it became really interesting um, to... Oh, and of course, I won't be able to sign in. So there is a video available. And for me, it was really interesting to create a very, it's a 15 minute long loop that, that belongs in the gallery. And it's a very quiet process of just collecting samples, breaking rocks, you know, counting how many tiny little um, uh, tadpoles, for example, are on particular lakes and just trying, you know, using data to kind of understand the world. But it's underlied by this kind of really uh, dramatic score that for me became really interesting. So it has a very kind of a lot of drama added through the music and it kind of it, it kind of directs us to think about exactly the ramifications of the very quiet observation. Um, and for me, it became a very beautiful um, way to just observe the things that are happening in the background um, to to understand what's happening around us. So with that, I think it would be great to um, open it up to any questions. Uh, I would hope that you would direct them to um, either Patrick or Jeff. It would be great to hear a question or two. So I'll open it up and stop sharing the screen for a moment. Yes, I'm, I'm sure. We've, I mean, that was really, I mean, really great. Honestly, if you could see the room, um, really, <laughs> I'm just so moved. You know, it's just to feel like I've gone to the exhibition. We had some comments. Kelly said, um, thank you, Patrick. You made me wish I could have seen it all in person. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's really great presentations thank you so much um so um do you want to put your hand up anybody who wants to give a question they can turn their screen on ask the question type the question anybody they were a bit shy oh kelly Please. yeah you know me i'm not shy <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, all of you, for coming online. That was absolutely fabulous. I'm devastated that in 10 minutes I have to go to another meeting. Um, but I wanted to ask Jeff, um, uh, mostly Jeff, but a little Patrick, a little bit. Could you talk a little bit more about um, your collaboration and how you how you start a collaboration? And especially because you said this this Zoom experience was such a new one, and I was curious. You said it was quite intimate, and I was curious what you felt like you gained in that intimate collaboration space that we were able to create sometimes online. I was quite curious to hear more about that, if you could. And thank you all very much. I'm going to disappear when I have to, but it's so interesting. I wish I could stay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think with, with Patrick and I, we had actually been on a, on a arts grants jury together. And I remember being so impressed that he could remember all of these things and uh, and, and give back all this information without looking at anything. <laughs> and then I'm the complete opposite. I kind of uh, I kind of dream off and get lost in in another space in that. So when I when we when Patrick approached me about taking on this project, I thought we'll probably be a pretty good match for each other in terms of um, personalities in that. So it began from a good place uh, in regards to that. And I, and I think that what was really interesting about the Zoom is that, um, I, you know, it, you kind of feel like it's impersonal in a way, but then when you start talking and sharing information, you quickly find that it's not, that it's actually quite personal and you don't feel uh, defensive um, because you're not, you know, directly, you know, in each other's space, <clears throat> and um, you just kind of talk and go, and um, and that was really quite, quite. I think one of the um, one of the really important components was was people being able to share like that. And we had wished that we had recorded a lot of the conversations that we had because because they were so good and. Um, we could have done a lot with that, but that was the idea with uh, with Zoom, and I was really surprised um, of, at how well it worked, and um, and the importance that it had for both of us in terms of uh, being able to not only for us to work together, but how all the artists I think into embraced um, 
our personalities as well. Thanks, Jeff. I'll, I'll be really brief, but thank you for your question so much, Kelly. Um, you know, I remember very vividly when Jeff and I were on this Ontario Arts Council grant uh, jury, and and in fact, there had been a there had been a work where there was a, a reference to the uh, two row wampum, and I remember Jeff, and this is like twenty years ago, but I remember Jeff's kind of discussion of that. And, you know, so over the years we saw each other, but I wasn't even really thinking about that, you know, about the two row wampum specifically when I asked Jeff if he would be willing to uh, co-curate this. In fact, I had already approached a whole range of artists who were willing to be part of the project and Jeff was one, but it was clear that I couldn't, not only couldn't do this myself, but that the work really required there to be a collaboration around decolonization and around, um, you know, some of the, the issues that, that Jeff and, and Mark have raised so substantially. I guess the last thing I would say is that you know, where I certainly teach on Zoom and there's a way in which it becomes kind of very institutionalized, but somehow working with artists, you know, there was a way in which one studio visit, getting on a plane to make one studio visit was nothing compared to having many conversations, you know, with people and they can't show you very much, but somehow the intimacy of that was really, really a gift. And, and so worked well with the artists and certainly well for Jeff and I, who, I used to think maybe he's getting sick of me, but we we've managed to hang in there, and <laughs> and, uh, and and it's been pretty good. So thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, and we've got Kirsty for the next question. Hi, um, I've got two questions actually, if that's okay. But I'll try and make them brief, so I know we're at time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well. <laughs> thank you for presenting as well and after breakfast and all of that but um I found it really really interesting but a couple of questions that I kind of wrestle with myself you're doing a lot of work around the environment and the environmental impact that we're having how do you balance that with all the kind of technology and environmental damage of an exhibition of traveling of of planes of printing of you know how do you manage that morally <laughs> and then the second question patrick was for you really you talked about a moment of transformation and i was just wondering if you could just kind of explain that a little bit more so maybe i'll i'll just sort of respond um, fairly quickly to both yeah, I think the question about uh, so-called sustainability and art exhibitions is huge. And in fact, one of my colleagues, also named Kirsty, Kirsty Robertson, has just started at our university, the Center for Sustainable Curating. And it's, it is all about looking at this very seriously. So one of the artists in the exhibition, Michelle Wilson, it was actually, is actually doing a kind of analysis of the exhibition around its footprint. And I do think that um, there are ways in which, as I look at the wonders of this show, uh, there's certain things that I think we weren't able to do, which is a good thing, i.e. get on planes very much. Um, but there's no question, there's, there's, um, there's all kinds of consumption. And I think that it's, um, I'm not really able to answer the question other than to say it's absolutely um, it's absolutely uh, significant and a lot of the work by the artist was involving recycled materials, but that sounds a little bit uh, a bit pat. Um, when I talk about transformation, I, I'm interested in these kind of moment in the sort of moment we're at where there's so much changing. And so my, you know, as I said in a conversation yesterday, my curating, I think, is really about asking questions and my work is really about asking are we actually participating in the kind of transformation that seems possible uh, at this stage I mean not in in maybe optimistic terms um, in indeed in the way Mark Mark uh, was referring to the situation we're in but you know I do think that we're in a time where where we not only need to be engaged in transformation around the environment but that needs to be synonymous with decolonization and that was the whole kind of point of this so that sounds a little bit like rhetoric but um that's my best shot at it jeff any thing you want to add 
Yeah, I've been thinking about that. And I think, you know, what I find, I think from, from my perspective is, is that as an indigenous person and as an activist is that um, I think that uh, using Zoom certainly cut back a lot on that carbon footprint. And that, that's good. But I also think that given the amount of waste that's going on in the world, if we can contribute a bit of thought um, to, to the issues that, that we're facing, because, you know, as Mark had said, and, and what I've said before, too, is that, you know, the, um, we're not killing the planet, we're killing ourselves. And at some point or another, we have to take uh, responsibility for that. Um, and not wait until there's no answer um, and um, we're looking at the end. Well, the, the idea for this exhibition, I think, given all of the kind of things that are going on around the world and that, that this was an opportunity to, um, to begin to talk about how we're going to work together. And I thought that that was far more important um, than um, some of the other issues that, um, well, let's say that, well, this is a museum, this is typical uh, kind of art space to exhibit in and that, and it carries its own issues, I think with myself as well. And, um, and um, I wanted, uh, so this was an opportunity to, um, to take that, uh, take the museum and take the environment, take the population of London, Ontario, and the people that will see it and hear our voices and say that, um, yeah, we need to really start thinking about this in a serious way. So those are the people that I was hoping that we would have an impact on. And so the idea of uh, utilizing all the resources that we can to bring that um, to the public was, was, was far more than far more important to me than almost anything else in terms of can this have an impact and I always like to believe that it does or I wouldn't continue to do this work. And I think to, uh, one uh, a thing I wanted to comment on too quickly was just in terms of the undercurrent for a lot of the things that we're looking at, like with Lori Blundo's work in the in the um, coming into the museum, coming into the gallery space, and seeing these these large portraits of Lori hanging there, is that um, it speaks to to the rapid kind of um, mistreatment of Indigenous women in, in North America, uh, murder and missing Indigenous women and girls, and how it continues to go on and on and on. And Indigenous women are, 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 are just kind of, it's, it's horrible what goes on here. And so with Laurie's uh, photographs there in the beginning, it's, you know, people come in with perceptions of things that they've heard on the news and things like that, murdering indigenous women and that. And then here are these large mural size prints of an indigenous woman proudly standing there and having something to say, which is quite a counterbalance to the history of representation of indigenous women with no voice and no name. So these are the kind of the other more subtle undercurrents that, uh, that are taking place in, in the exhibition as well. But just like looking, uh, I'll say, you know, like with Mark as well, uh, talking to him and going over his work in that, and you immediately find that kind of common ground and, and a willingness to work, which is kind of like the subtleties of, of, uh, of uh, what's transpired through this exhibition. And it's transformed me too. You know, it's given me a lot of hope that all the things that I've been thinking about over the decades and wanting to try to do um, can actually happen. It took a long time, but they can happen. So, you know, these are all the important points that uh, keep in mind for this project as well. Oh, that's really good. Thank you so much. We've had a few comments. I don't know if you've seen in the comment boxes. Um, Kelly says, Jeff, I grew up just a mile or two away from Can. Canodigan, and I was delighted to learn more about the treaty and your work. Thank you all very much. And um, a lot of um, there's Sally saying she agrees to the intimacy of Zoom. It's opened up opportunities um, and has made us think so much more about our working space. Uh, and lots of thank yous. So um, you know, I think we can wrap it up here. And did you, Mark? Did you want to ask one of your very Difficult questions. No, it's not. You didn't need to. No, I'm glad that uh, people stepped in and asked some other difficult questions, which was great. Well, no.
just all it's just a, a we only just scraped the surface didn't we we could have done another four hours i think so we need to have um, definitely invite you both back you know um we've just started a really interesting conversation um so thank you all very much for coming um I just wanted to say thank you for the really gracious uh, welcome and, and embrace of our, our work and our project. And thank you to Mark for, for making the initial connection. It's a real yeah. privilege for us. So thank thanks. you. You should have come to Leicester. We would have really, you know, you could have a gorgeous Asian meal from our, down our Asian mile. And yeah, next time you've got to come to Leicester and really see how we welcome people. <laughs> next time for sure. Cool. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. So we can you can stop recording the and thank you, Nisa, for um the gallery technician for recording.